Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike, and you're listening to our Sunday morning Sunday school lesson. We hope you enjoy this, and you can hear more of our sermons and teachings at www.visitbethelchurch.org. God bless you, and have a great day. I had mentioned Wednesday that the Obama administration was wanting to outlaw children doing chores on farms. <clears throat> and uh, a guy wrote me an email from Australia. And he said, Pastor, he said, for eight years ago, the Australian government did the same thing. They made it illegal for anybody under 16 years old to do farm chores, even if it was their own family's farm. And he also said that <clears throat> the Australian government does not allow hardly anybody to have a gun. And I wrote him back and I said, yeah. I said, Obama has backed off this position and it might have something to do with the people who have the most guns in this country are farmers. Amen. <laughs> okay. uh, anyway, um, it's, it's, we are allowed to and I think we have a responsibility to as, as Americans citizens of a government, uh, but as born-again believers whom God has given light and given freedom, if the government pushes, it's okay to push back. Let them know that's, that's not how we want it. Amen? Amen? Nothing wrong with that at all. Take your Bibles this morning. <clears throat> We're looking at the mystery uh, of God. What is the mystery? I always like to look at a good mystery. Wanted to know mysteries, wanted to know secret things, wanted to know what somebody else didn't know. That's just always been in my heart. And we're studying that idea through the Bible. Um, it started out in 1 Corinthians um, where the Apostle Paul talked about um, we speak the, word, the wisdom of God in a mystery in 1 Corinthians 2.7. And then he said in 1 Corinthians 4, 1, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And <clears throat> there is a, there's really w one great big gigantic concept, and it's broken up into these little ideas that go along with this. Um, what we're finding out is when we look at what the Bible says uh, concerning the word mystery, we find out that God actually reveals mysteries. He reveals these things to us. And I want you to understand the benefit of having a, a doctrinal system or a belief system about God where it's not left up to man to tell you what God wants you to know. It's not left up to, to one man. It's not, in other words, it's not up to me as the minister uh, or a, a pope of some kind. It's not let, left up to some mysterious religious uh, group that's going to determine, well, this is who God is and this is, this is what we want you to believe. God is the one who reveals, the, he, he reveals himself through the scriptures. He reveals his ideas. And he didn't just leave it up to what we wanted to tell you. Everybody in here has a Bible. And if you don't physically have one that you brought with you, there's some in the pews here that you can just pull out. And anything that you want to know, you can know because it's all plainly written right here. Um, I had an interesting week this week. Good morning, guys. Had an interesting week this week. And I mentioned this last Sunday morning during Sunday school. Um, and God led me on Thursday uh, in one of the broadcasts I did to, to just talk about the biblical doctrine of tongues and whether or not it's right or not, whether or not what these people are doing is right or wrong. And I went, I started with the Old Testament, started working all the way through. And I can tell you that um, as a biblical principle, God wants his people to know rather than not know. And I'm going I'm to be preaching this morning on, on biblical ignorance versus biblical knowledge. My people are destroyed for a lack of what? Knowledge. For a lack of knowledge. And just as an, an idea or a principle, I have a huge problem with thinking that if I went into some sort of prayer mode, 
that stuff would be flying out of my mouth that neither me nor anybody else would know what it was. I have a problem with that. I think it comes from childhood when I would say words that I would hear from the neighborhood boys and my mom would say, you know what that means? No. Then don't be saying it. Okay. So that's just how my mom raised me. If I didn't know what it meant, I better not say it. Amen? Amen. God is in the revelation of mysteries. And one of the things, one of, one of my issues with what these people are calling unknown tongues is that they're saying things and they're saying that God is giving them revelations or God is giving them words that are in languages that no one can understand. And that's supposed to somehow give edification. I don't, I don't go for that. I don't buy that. Okay? I'm edified when I know something. Uh, it's, sort of, it's sort of like... Um, it's sort of like if you went to the doctor and the doctor said, well, we see something here and we don't know what it is. In three weeks, come back and we'll tell you. Now, for three weeks, you can't eat, sleep, cope, be nice to people. For three weeks, your life is stuck until you go back to the doctor. You go back to the, and you're sitting there in the waiting room in anticipation your, your appointment was 10 o'clock. Finally, at 1045, they call you back in the room. And then finally, at 1130, the doctor comes in with a little envelope looking at it. And you're waiting to hear from him. You've been waiting now for three weeks. And then he comes out and says, we don't know what it is. That doesn't edify you. No. If he comes back then, and, to, and either way... Either way, what he tells you, we're better off knowing. If I know, I can deal with it. We can find out what's going on. Amen? So having something unknown does not edify. It does not bless. It doesn't help anybody. It helps when we know things. And God wants us to know things. He's wanting to fill some people's minds with doctrine and with understanding and knowledge and wisdom and revelation of mysteries. That's who he's looking for. God is no longer interested in keeping back secrets that nobody can find out. That is not God. That's not who he is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Are you there? Say amen. 1 Corinthians 15. Or maybe I ought to wait, give you a few minutes, and then I'll ask you to say amen. 1 Corinthians 15. When I got into the prophecy discussion, I decided to just leave everything behind and then go to the Lord and ask him questions all over again. God, is there going to be a rapture? Is there going to be a translation? Is there going to be that? Some were saying yes, some were saying no. And I decided not to listen to anybody either way. I decided to ask, Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. And um, so I just asked God, God, would you show it to me here? Um, I want us to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, and it is loaded. I mean, it is just absolutely loaded with biblical flavors, okay? I like, I like flavorful things, amen? Okay, now I like eggs. Eggs are okay. I really like eggs, but they're not, you have to add stuff to eggs to get them to be flavorful, okay? Well, 1 Corinthians 15 has all the ingredients together for a nice little dish, okay? And it's just a beautiful place. But verse 50 says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I want you to take note of that. That is a very vital and essential uh, passage in the scripture. It's backed up in various places, one of which is in John chapter 3, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Or Which is the kingdom of God or heaven, Gary? Kingdom of God. He can't accept a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Somebody wrote me this morning, and they said that they are they are they got some people on Facebook that are climbing all over them, telling them 
that uh, being born again is not for Gentiles, it's for Israel only. And I'm going, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my life. Where do people come up with this garbage? People come up with the biggest pack of nonsense that I've ever heard in my life. If you are not born again, you're dead. You will not. And, and I want you to notice the word inherit. Inherit. An inheritance is given from a father to a child. If you are not born again, you are not his child. Therefore, you have no inheritance. Okay? When Howard Hughes died, I did not sue his estate for my half. Do you know why? I'm not his heir. I have no right to the inheritance of Howard Hughes or anybody else for that matter. Have no right to it whatsoever. Okay? And so, uh, the kingdom of God is an inheritance. It is something that is handed down to us from our Father. And if God is not your Father, you say, well, and you ask the question about, uh, that's what Nicodemus asked him, how, how can I be going to my mother's womb the second time? Different mother and a different father. Instead of your earthly parents birthing you again, it is God your Father. And Galatians chapter 4 says, Jerusalem, which is above, which is free, is the mother of us all. So I was born once of this world. That just simply means that I will pass away with this world as well, because this world is going to pass away. If I am born again from my Father and from heaven, which never passes away, then neither will I pass away. And so flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. That, that was what Jesus was trying to teach when he was teaching the whole thing about you cannot put new wine into what? Old bottles. You can't put new wine into old bottles. If you have an old bottle... That bottle is old, it, it's decaying, it's, it's rotting, it's not going to hold up. Back then, their, their wine bottles were made out of leather. Okay? That's, what they were, that's what they carried around, the big leather pouches that they, that they held wine in. And those things, after a while, you know anything that's leather, I mean, it lasts a while, but it don't last forever. And eventually, you just cannot pour new wine into an old bottle. It's just not any good. It's got to go into a new bottle. And so this, I, I, I promise you, I do not want this body to live forever. I promise you I don't. Okay? I don't like it. I want out of it. Amen? Okay? That, that's what the Bible talks about. The creation groaneth. And every day when you wake up, you just go, oh, oh. And you groan and say, God, give me a new body. Somebody say Amen. So anyway, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. And then he said, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. Look at there. There it is, right there. The word mystery is here, and yet the Bible is going to reveal the mystery. It's going to open up something for you that all in the Old Testament, it was kept closed. No one could figure it out. Now it's going to be opened up. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. What does sleep mean in the Bible? They shall sleep. Sleep. <clears throat> they shall sleep the sleep of death. That's what the Bible means. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So right here, <clears throat> Paul's laying out something for us that at some point something's going to happen. And whoever is here at that time, that number one, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we actually have two witnesses here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us, that the dead in Christ, those who have died before us, they will rise first. They will come up out of the graves. Okay? That's why we planted them there to begin with. Amen? Well, that's, that's what I preached at my dad's graveside ceremony was, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And I said, it, it pains me immensely. To be able to put this into the ground, but I know what I'm doing. It's seed. And I know what's going to happen one of these days. That seed's going to come up. 
Amen? It's going to rise up one of these days. So the dead in Christ is going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, with the dead, and the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's what the scripture says. And I don't see how anybody looking at scripture can deny that this is going to happen. It says that's very plain. It's very plain what the scripture is laying out here. It doesn't even... It's not even a mystery anymore. Behold, I'll show you a mystery. We should not all sleep. We should all be changed. Verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Okay, everybody blink. That fast. Okay, and somebody challenged me on, on my use of that. I looked up the word twinkle. Twinkle and blinkle come from the same place. It's the same idea. Okay, when you see a star twinkle, you look at stars at night, they twinkle, they flash, okay? That's, that's what they're doing. By the way, planets, you know how you tell a planet from a star? Planets do not twinkle. Just thought I'd throw that in. You write that down somewhere. You go out on a clear night and look. If you see a very bright star up there and it's not twinkling, it's a planet because it's closer to us and doesn't have all the junk between. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Okay? <clears throat> might come in handy. You never know. Okay? You just might need that information. Um, in a twinkling of an eye. So a blink, and it's over with. It's, it's done. So if you're not ready now, you're wasting time, and you're playing with something very, very dangerous. Because one of these days, some people are going to blink, and there's some people not going to be here that fast. It's that fast. By the way, your life is that way too. Boom. You can be gone just like that. Boom, you're dead. Okay? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Did you know that's the exact same phrase that's referred to the, the Bible when it talks about the incorruptible seed of the Word of God? Same word. So we do not expect that when we get to heaven, that after, let's say, a billion and a half years in heaven, that we'll start growing gray hair again, okay, and our back will hurt. We don't expect that, do we? Because we will be incorruptible. Likewise, the word now that you have is incorruptible. It does not weaken. It doesn't go down. It doesn't degrade. It doesn't corrupt. Okay, it's back, even though my Bible is getting pretty flimsy, it's just now getting to where I like it. Amen? It's like a new baseball glove, right? New baseball gloves, I don't like them. You give me one that's been all broke in, about four, five, six years old, then it's good, all right? So anyway, but the word will not corrupt, it is incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put in uncorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. There's so, so many things here that I could talk about this morning, but I want us to go back very quickly. And let's look at something that in the Old Testament, it was a mystery. They didn't have any explanation for it, but now we can see clearly that the mystery is revealed. So we're going to hold our place there, and I want you to go to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. <clears throat> we have an interesting story. This was in the days prior to the flood. <clears throat> We have a man by the name of Enoch. And in Genesis chapter 5 verse 21, the Bible says, And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. You've heard of Methuselah, haven't you? The oldest man recorded in the Bible. 969 years old. Okay? That is one old pair of tennis shoes. Amen? That is one old pair of tennis shoes. Um, <clears throat> in verse 22... And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. 
And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And I want you to notice verse 24. And Enoch walked with God and he was not. For God took him. Okay? God took him. He walked with God and then blink, he was not. He was not around. He was not there. Uh, turn to um, Hebrews chapter 11. The Bible's going to shed light on what it means here. Hebrews 11. <clears throat> Notice now the Bible is giving light. It's revealing a mystery. Hebrews 11 verse 5. By faith Enoch was translated. There's that word translated. Which means he was taken from one, one form to another. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. I asked in a conference one time, what does it take to please God? Somebody said obedience. And I said, no. I mean, obedience would to obey is better than sacrifice. But who in here has done that? But look at the next verse. Verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please him. Since we cannot obey, the least we can do is just believe. Amen? Amen? Believe what God said. So now the mystery here of what happened to Enoch, it's not a mystery anymore. I mean, all of a sudden he's gone. And you can imagine the people, you know, Methuselah, where, where's dad? Where's dad? I don't know. And everybody's looking for Enoch and no one can find Enoch. He was not. Here it says, he was translated that he should not see death. Enoch did not die. But immediately, without seeing death, his body was changed. It was transformed into, a, into his new spirit or spiritual body. Um, and God translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. In Genesis 5, it says that he walked with God. The two go hand in hand. Take your Bible. Turn to 2 Kings, if you would. 2 Kings. So we have Enoch that was just out, I don't know, doing something. And all of a sudden he wasn't there anymore. God translated him. In the second Kings chapter 2, here we have Elijah. In verse 7 of second Kings chapter 2, and 50 men of the sons, 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. Elijah took his mantle, wrapped it together, and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went uh, over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Left. Was taken up. Caught up. Okay? Chariot ride into glory. Whatever you want to call it. Both Enoch and Elijah left this world without either one of them seeing death. And they were transported, translated. Uh, the, word, the word rapture, which some people have a huge problem with, I don't. Because the word rapture is a Latin word which means caught up. The exact language in your King James Bible is caught up in 1 Thessalonians 4. That's what it says. Shall be caught up together with them. Okay? So whether you're using the word translation or rapture or caught up, it all means the same thing. And what the Bible's telling us, now the Bible gives us two Old Testament witnesses. Those who do not believe in the rapture should ask Enoch Elijah whether or not it happens. Amen? Amen? And they'll say, yep. And the Bible says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And so if you have a question in your mind about whether this is going to happen, just ask Enoch and Elijah. They'll tell you. Oh, yeah, and it's fun. Okay? It's great. And, um, you know, it's natural for us to have a fear of death, but I don't think I'll have a fear of rapture. Amen? Amen. Looking forward to that one. Uh, but anyway, so the Bible 
<clears throat> even though even though in the Old Testament, those who simply read the Old Testament will read of Enoch and re- will read of Elijah, and that will be a mystery to them. They do not and cannot comprehend what happened to them. And I could I could spend a lot of time this morning in the Old Testament showing you the translation of the Gentile saints all over all throughout the scriptures. It is it's one of the most beautiful things that I've ever seen in the Bible. I can show it to you in the story of the Ten Commandments. It's there. It's a neat, neat story. It's a neat concept. But it was it was a mystery to the Old Testament and to anybody who just simply uh, knows the Old Testament. When you read the New Testament, Paul here now explains what happened to Enoch, what happened to Elijah, okay? And uh, what happened What happened at Daly Plaza? You ever, you ever ask that question? Wouldn't you like to get into a time machine and go back? Be honest, Wayne. Get in a time machine and go back to Daly Plaza uh-huh, and set up cameras everywhere, Okay? And record the event as it happened. So you find out what happened. Wouldn't that be neat? It'd be awesome. Okay? We may not ever know here, but we'll know. Even as we are known. Okay? But right now, we can know. We can know that this is going to take place. Sometime, it's going to take place. The Lord is going to appear in the clouds. And when he does appear in the clouds then you and I, if we're truly born again, will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We will never be apart from him ever, 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 ever again. I'm looking forward to that. Some days more than others. Can I get an amen out of you? Some days more than others. But that is one of the the things related to the mystery of God. Let's look at some more that are kind of... Kind of, uh, kind of compounded in with this. Turn to Ephesians. There's actually one, two, three, four, five places in the book of Ephesians that, that reveal the mystery of God. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. The Bible's look at what it says. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. I believe that if you're seeking the will of God, you'll find the will of God. Because God reveals his mysteries to you. Let me, and I've explained it this way to some people. It's really helped them. People say, how can I know the will of God? God tends to make it easy for those who actually want to know, for those who will actually look. Let me illustrate it this way. Okay? Think of in the Old Testament when the, when the Israelites were in the wilderness. And they would be out, uh, they would camp out someplace. And the Bible tells us that every time they made a camp, they put the tabernacle in the middle. They put the camps of the tribes of Israel around that. And then when they would set up the tabernacle and put the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place, then a cloud, a cloud would appear over the most holy place. There would be this, this pillar of cloud, like a whirlwind, like a tornado cloud, just staying right there over that. That, that was to show them that God's presence was with them in the camp. Now, here's what happened. If anybody ever had a question about whether or not they were going to move that day or the next day, all they had to do was look to see where the cloud was. They got up the next morning. Let's say it was Thursday morning. They got up Thursday morning, and they would look over toward the tabernacle. If they saw the cloud there, that meant we're staying here today. Need to go milk some goats and get some eggs in and get, we're going to go about our business. But if they got up the next day and they saw the cloud over on the next field over, you know what that meant? God was saying to them, I will be patient and I will wait for you here, but you need to pack everything up because we're leaving, we're moving. That's how simple that was. The Israelites did not walk blindly through the wilderness. They followed the cloud. Wherever the cloud took them, that's where they followed. Jesus is that cloud. He is the glory of the Lord in the cloud, by the way. That's what the Bible says of him. He is the one appearing in the cloud. And following Christ is really not a mystery. You simply got to look where he's going to be, and he will wait for you. But he will never keep it a mystery if you'll ask him, God, what do you want me to do? God, how do you want me to do this? God, what do you want me to say? I have to ask God, what do you want me to preach? God, what do you want me to preach? How do you want me to preach this? God always says, Mike, preach this. 
God will lead me or God will, yeah, I'll be reading something. God will say, here, study this right here. Or however it works, God will always, it doesn't have to be a mystery, which is a lot better than downloading them from the Internet. Amen. Or buying books. I have to admit, when I first got into preaching, years and years and years ago, I had some books. I don't know where I got them. It was, uh, they, and they were good sermons, but they were pre-written sermons. I have to admit. Okay? I don't have the books anymore. I don't need them. I got one. The sermons are already written out for me. Amen. Amen. And uh, it does, does apply a little work, but that's all right. But the mystery, the mystery is revealed. Where was we at? First Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of the will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. And I want you to notice that God's will for your life will always be centered around what God wants. It will be God's call first and not yours. If you've got it flipped around, you've got the cart before the horse. It won't work that way. Okay? It will be his purpose and his desire. Even Jesus taught us that in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he is in the garden, he does not want to drink from that cup that is before him. That cup was his suffering and his crucifixion. And he did not, his flesh, naturally, did not want to go through with that. But he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. As soon as you recognize the authority of God as Lord over your life, the happier you'll be. It's kind of like in any workplace environment or in any realm of life whatsoever. As soon as you recognize who's in charge, then your life will be fine after that. Amen? As soon as you get it figured out, who's in charge and who calls the shots, then everything will be okay. There's, and there's, there's no, there's no uh, war entanglement with God as far as who's in charge. It will be always him in charge. And then he'll, God, listen, if God wants you to do something, he's not going <laughs> to, boy, I want to, I want to be mean. Let's say that sometimes us husbands have a hard time figuring out what you wives want. Because you won't actually come out and tell us. You'll just gaze it into us. Amen? And we have to go, what? 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 What did I do? Nothing. That's not true. It's not true. Okay? Um, God's never going to gaze at you long enough until you guess. If you want to know what God wants you to do, he'll tell you. Amen? He'll reveal it to you. He'll tell you. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. Turn over. One page here. Ephesians 3, 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things in Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. I want you to understand this, that God is telling you what he would not tell angels. You think about that. Lucifer did not know, the serpent, the dragon, the devil, did not know that by killing Christ, that would bring about his ultimate defeat. God would not reveal that to him. But he's revealed it to us. I get it. I understand it. Okay? Um, the Bible says when Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, I can now look at the devil and say, Devil, that was the stupidest thing you've ever done in your life. Okay? Because we know this. Look at that, look at that again. We have, number one, we are in the fellowship of the mystery. That means we all agree and we're all in fellowship by way of the word of God. Okay? Which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church. The manifold wisdom of God. God is letting the angels. See, the angels in the Old Testament were the messengers of God. Now who's the messengers? We are. We're the messengers of the covenant. We're the ones who are going to tell angels what, what the mystery is. I think that's pretty cool. That's, I think that's one of the reasons why the devil don't like you. 
Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32. Turn there. Oh, this is beautiful. This is absolutely beautiful. Can I meddle in your marriage for a few minutes? Sure, Pastor Mike. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> let's, let's be fair. Let's go back to verse 21 in Ephesians chapter 5. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Okay? I think in a marriage, I think the husband ought to be submitted to the wife, the wife to be submitted to the husband. Okay? The husband does not act alone in a marriage. The husband does not make, he does not make all the decisions. He's not his brain alone. And, and the woman must not always be in silence and in fear that she's going to open her mouth and get her head knocked off. Can I hear you say amen? amen. Okay? God gave me my wife who has counseled me and helped me over the years. And um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am today without her. No doubt about it. I would not be today where I am without her. And so I have an obligation toward my wife to listen to her. Now, I pray for her all the time that the counsel that she gives me would be godly, wise counsel. Okay? Um, and I, we have a, Lisa and I have a deal. We worked it out years ago to keep us from leaving one another was that I was going to listen to her. And if it didn't sound right, then she was going to leave me alone, and I was going to just think about it and pray about it. And I would. We'd do that. She'd say something to me, and it just wouldn't sound right. And a lot of times I found out that if I give myself time to think it through and to think about it, a lot of times I'd find out, you know, that, hey, that was pretty good. But what I'd do with pray, praying about it was that if I was going to go against her, and do what I really felt God was telling me to do, then God was going to bless that anyway, and God would show my wife. See how it just works? Yes. That way we're not fighting one another all the time. That way I don't think she's stupid, and she don't think I don't listen to her. Okay? But anyway, verse 22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. The church submits to the Lord. Amen? By the way, let's, let's put this back, back where I was a while ago. The husband listening to the wife. Who do we pray to? Jesus. Who is that to us? He's the bridegroom. He's the husband. Jesus listens to everything his church says to him. Jesus listens to everything he his church says to him. And if his church says, Jesus, we need this, then Jesus listens to that. And he will, and I like this, okay? Jesus will either give his church what they ask for, or he will give them something better than what they ask for. So the wife asks, honey, can I have this ring? It's only got one little bitty stone in it. Okay? You can either get her that ring or the next one over that's twice as good. I think she'll be happy with it. I think she will not be disappointed with a better thing. I can tell you that when God has decided not to give me what I've asked for, but to give me something better, I never complained. Amen. I never, I went, oh, I'll take this. This is a lot better. That's, that's the husband. Amen? The husband listens. Uh, verse 23, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, there it is, husbands, love your wives. That's actually harder than the woman obeying the husband. It's actually harder to do. Because when your wife is not in a good mood and she's not feeling well, and, she's, and it, it stirs up feelings in the husband. He can get bitter against his wife. And the Bible says, husbands, be not bitter against them. So watch your attitude, boys. Okay, be not bitter against your wife. Sometimes you may have to go outside in the woodshed and pray about that one. I've done that one. Don't have a woodshed, but I've gone and prayed, God, don't let me be bitter at my wife. 
And all of a sudden, a sweet spirit comes in, and all of a sudden, I'm not mad anymore, and neither is she. I've actually seen the Holy Ghost just intervene between Lisa and I, and all of a sudden, it was just a different spirit. That's sweet. Okay? Um, Loves your wife, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing uh, of water by the word, that he might present to it himself... A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and a mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now you understand the mystery of marriage, don't you? It's a picture of Christ and the church. God is unfolding. Aren't you glad? Somebody say amen. amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, that you'd bless now this teaching. Bless it in the hearts and the ears of these people, dear God. And Lord, give us understanding. Give us help, Lord. Lord, it's better, Lord, that we know rather than what we don't know. And so, Lord, fill our minds and our hearts with knowledge. And bless this lesson and bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Hello, folks. Pastor Mike here. And sometimes you'll hear me talk about during a sermon or a teaching about being saved or salvation. And some people just don't know what that is. And I just want to share with you from the Bible what it means to be saved. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. I'm not here as a pastor or here as part of this church because I'm better than anybody. I'm here because I'm a sinner. I have done things that have violated the laws of God. And uh, I need to be sorry for those. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. We all have what's coming to us as a result of our sinfulness and as a result of us breaking God's law. And some people say, well, you know, it says death. Yeah, we're all going to die. But that doesn't necessarily mean hell. The Bible also says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. See, the Bible teaches, and we teach here in a literal place called hell. We believe in a literal place of uh, joy and peace and eternal life that is in heaven that God gives to those that are saved. But we also believe in e eternal hell, a place of everlasting torment to those who reject God's gift of salvation. So we know that we have sinned. We know that the wages of that sin is death. But the Bible says in the same verse, Romans 6, 23, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John three sixteen says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, including me and including you, would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Being saved means being born again and being saved from the wrath of God's judgment upon us, what we deserve, what we have coming as a result of our sinfulness. So the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I don't know about you, but one of the greatest things, in fact, the greatest thing that has ever happened to Mike Hoggard is the fact that I confessed my sins to God and God forgave and still does forgive every one of my sins. Romans 10 says it this way. It says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What it means to be saved is that God has, has cornered you with the result and the things, the effects of your sin in your life. The Holy Spirit is bearing down on your soul right now and you feel the guilt of Almighty God upon you. And God is trying to make you so that you just like our parents used to do. God used to, is trying to make you sorry for your sins. We confess those sins to God. We repent of them, which means that we don't want sin to be a part of our life any longer. And we simply ask God, God, you take over the reins in my life and you be the Lord of my life. And you give me the promise of your Holy Spirit in me so that I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven now. And I want you to understand that God offers salvation to you today if you will accept 
his free gift. Trust in the Lord, repent of your sins. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you watch any of our videos or at some point and God is just dealing with you, you bow your head and you call upon the name of the Lord and ask God to forgive you and ask God to save you. And God promised in his word and God has never broken his word. God promised in his word that he would forgive you and that he would save you and heaven would be your eternal home. I hope and pray that one of these days I see you in heaven and you get to see me in heaven. God bless you. Bye-bye.